chapter 22. talk this evening about finding mercy and responding to it. Finding mercy and responding to it. 2 Kings chapter 22. What you say? Oh, it's chapter 22. We're going to read uh, verses 1 and 2 and uh, then we're going to we're going to go ahead and jump down to verse 8 from that. Okay, so in 2 Kings 22, verse 1, the scripture reads, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. How old are you, Josiah? Nine. Too late. It's not going to happen for you. Okay. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was... Why did you have to think about it so long? <laughs> his mother's name was Jedidiah, huh? uh, the daughter of Adiah of uh, Bosketh. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right and or to the left. And uh, then we see in verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the priest, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king, and brought the king word again, and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and delivered it to the hand of them to do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Now, in verse 10, Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And I will pray. Father, please help us tonight. Help us to recognize the spirit that Josiah had and what it was about him that pleased you so. And Father, help us to recognize in you uh, those traits of mercy which are so consistent for which God can help us to respond by loving you more. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Josiah wasn't going to a wedding and renting a tuxedo. Renting his clothes means he was tearing his clothes, right, Andrew? So, not like Anthony picking up a flower pot. Anthony had a flower pot problem. Two, were, you there? were you there for that, Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't very funny, was it? No, it wasn't, no. Very, it wasn't funny now. It's, <laughs> it's funny now, but it's yeah. not funny now. I, uh, I can totally relate. I don't buy pants at Walmart, I'll tell you that much, at all. And because they just... You got to you got to find out something that's made with good quality. Now the Sam's Club M brand that they used to make members mark, those things are tough, but they don't make them anymore. So I'm thinking about selling the ones that I've got on eBay or something. They're probably worth a lot of money because you can't rent them easily. But uh, Levi 501s, you can rent those. You can rent most suits that I've had. Um, not pay money for them, but I mean literally they tear <laughs> at at the worst times, unfortunately. That's uh, essentially what uh, we see here with the king. I mean, the king just literally is so upset. He grabs, I better be careful because I don't actually tear my stuff. He grabs his clothes and whoosh, just rips them up, just shreds them. I mean, just tears them up. And uh, sometimes when I try to call Charlie and he doesn't answer, I want to do that with my phone. I just want to fling it, just break something, you know. So it's one of these, I'm upset. And it's not a rage kind of thing, but it's upset. And it's a demonstration, demonstrably, upset he literally just rips his clothes up and so i will demonstrate that for you folks this evening because y'all would see the s on my t-shirt if, uh, if i did so i don't want to overdo anything andrew you're not even laughing man that was funny i'm into this i'm waiting i'm waiting i'm into this, <laughs> I'm into this he says. <laughs> anyway uh but realistically, what we see here from Josiah is that when he read the book of the law of God, he was able to compare the state of affairs in Judah with what God said they were supposed to be. You know, sometimes when we read the Word of God, society is so far removed even our lifestyles, the way we live, and our attitudes, 
are so far removed from what God wants, what pleases God, that our only conclusion can be we're in a lot of trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. And for Israel, they had received the, this is the way, walk ye in it. And they said, we'll obey the Lord. We will walk in it. We'll do this. Israel had a covenant. They had a contract with God. And God gave His law, and they said, we'll abide by it. We'll keep the law. The king, when he became king, remember, was supposed to write his own copy of the law. And poor Josiah knew so little about the law that he didn't have one to copy from. They're remodeling the temple. They're getting it back into, into the work, into the state of repair that it's supposed to be. And that's because of Josiah saying, hey, we need to be in the temple. God's real. We need to worship God. And he's set off to serve God. He has no idea what kind of a journey he's on. But notice the attitude that Josiah had when he began to serve the Lord. The Bible says in verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. This guy Josiah is eight years old and he's got character that few people I've met have. I've met a few people that are like this. It's, it's a wonderful thing to actually meet a believer who has decided, you know, I'm going to grow and I'm going to serve the Lord for the rest of my life. And you see him maybe five years after they've said that, and they've got about five years of growth. And you can see them ten years after that, and they've got about ten years of growth in their life. I mean, literally, they're serving more, they're more faithful, they're closer, they know God better, and they're where they ought to be for the time that they've been saved. That's just a refreshing thing. That was Josiah. I mean, literally, you know, some people, you know, you, we kind of, we get jaded a little bit when they say they're going to serve the Lord, and we kind of think, you know, I'm going to wait and see. Now, I try not to be like that. I don't think I'm too much like that anymore. Uh, I think some people belie their sincerity or their lack, lack of sincerity by things that are coupled with it. I think sometimes people try to impress you that they're going to serve God when they really aren't so concerned about serving God, and they're just things that are signs that they're, that they're not serious or consistent about it. Um, I've found that people come full circle a lot of times. They come to the Lord, they get away from the Lord, and they come back to the Lord. God brings things in their life and they just, sometimes it, it's almost like if you were to watch their life and, and if you were to describe it on a graph or something, it would just be like a bunch of circles. But generally speaking, they're going in a direction. You know, and this, hopefully the circles get tighter and tighter and then it pretty soon just gets to a line. Know, and they're just headed in a consistent direction. Uh, and so that's the way it is. But Josiah, I mean, I mean, the guy just started off, and the Bible says he didn't go from one path to the other. We illustrated uh, transgression this morning outside in the parking lot on one of the lines out there. And you know, one of the things they have someone to do to figure out if they're sober is to walk a line, right? And they have them walk on the line and stay on it. And to step off the line, right or left, is... A transgression is to, to go out of the way. And not Josiah. You know, a lot of the kings of Israel talks about the good things that they did. And then there's, uh, there is coupled with them the word nevertheless. And that's not usually a good thing. Or sometimes it tells the bad things that they did and it's coupled with a nevertheless. And that shows some of the good things that they did in spite of that. But Josiah is just one of these guys that actually at the end of his life, the record of him is that there wasn't any king before him that just consistently lived for God like he did. Now what a great example. What a great example that that is. And so now we see in, uh, in uh, verse, let's see where we at. We saw in verse 2 that he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside the right hand or the left. Well, that's good, isn't it? That's the way you ought to be. But then he gets his copy of the scriptures in verse 11 or verse 10. Shaphan read it before the king. And all of a sudden, Josiah, here he is set off in a pathway and he is going a direction and he realizes 
been trying to serve God. I've been doing what I knew. But <laughs> I was just a babe. I didn't know. And now he's got the Word of God, and, and as it hits him, he's overwhelmed by it. You know, some Christians don't respond that way. Some believers don't respond like Josiah. It's like they mean well, and they're thinking, you know, I'm serving God, and they're going a direction. And then all of a sudden, they get hit with something they didn't know about obedience, maybe, or faithfulness. And when they get hit with it, they kind of say, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying I haven't been doing everything I was supposed to do all this time? <laughs> and it offends them, almost, that their faithfulness or their righteousness, self-righteousness is what they are thinking along the lines of, actually, their self-righteousness is called into question. Not Josiah. Josiah read the Word of God, and he saw what the Word of God said, and he had a tender heart. And he had immediately mourned that in spite of the fact that he wanted to please God, that actually what Judah was, according to the Scripture, God would, was so displeased that impending doom and judgment was coming. Some people get mad at God. How many Christians think that God shouldn't judge a country because of their righteousness? You know, God, God won't judge you, but He might judge your country. He won't judge you, but He might judge a country that you're a part of. I love the way that Daniel handles the whole country matter. Uh, when he repents, you look at when Daniel read the Scripture and he saw that after 70 years that the captivity was supposed to be over, according to Jeremiah, and when he understood that, man, he got on his knees and he said, Hey, God, it's time. And he repented for the sins of his nation. And he said, I'm, I'm ready to repent. And you, you look at Daniel's life and you say, Hey, man, you didn't do that. You were consistent and faithful serving God. And yet, you know, he was uh, willing to be accountable for the sins of his nation. And that's Josiah. Josiah is not here saying, Hey, you know, listen, I'm the product of my environment. I'm a product of my father, Manasseh. I mean, think about it. Think about who I come from. Manasseh wasn't the wickedest king ever, but he was completely wicked. And uh, he set up all these groves and did all these things. And Josiah, Josiah didn't respond that way. He responded by renting his clothes and by repenting. And then he sought God. That's the second thing. He responded, first of all, with grief. And then in verse 12, the Bible says, And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah, servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book. Now stop there for a second. Uh, last week, we actually looked at, at King David, and we looked at his sin of adultery and murder. When did David get right? When did he get right? Or when? what was the climax for David that put him in the position where he needed to get right? When was it? Nathan. What? Yeah, when Nathan the prophet came and said, Thou art the man. You know, you don't need a prophet when you have the Word of God. I mean, God might expose you. Might, he might use circumstances. But when you have the Word of God, you have what's necessary to look at it. And God didn't need to send a prophet to Josiah and say, Thus saith the Lord. Judah has built groves. Judah has built altars. Judah has sold herself to do wickedly. And judgment's coming. Josiah read the Word of God and said, Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming because of what we've done. And my friend, you don't need God, you don't need God to send someone or to bring tragedy or chastisement in your life to know that judgment's coming. You can get in the Word of God. And I love the way that Josiah gets proactive about being right. It's a great example. He didn't step, he didn't go aside to the right or to the left, and he also was proactive about getting right. 
So he goes to the people that represent God, and he says, you guys go find out. You go find out what God, what we can do. We're going to repent over this deal. And so Hilkiah the priest, in verse 14, and Ahiah come, and Akbar, and Shaphan, and Asahiah went unto Huldah, the prophetess. And I don't know why some of y'all don't name your daughters Huldah. That's a real sweet name, Huldah. You know, you could make all kinds of jokes if you were romancing her, you know. Uh, anyway, went into Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now, <laughs> keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they've forsaken me and have burned incense. And well, that doesn't sound very merciful, does it? Because they have burned incense, they have forsaken me and burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Huh. I love that word but there, don't you? Did the people that were worshiping idols were uh, committing all these wicked acts? Boy, when you look at how when the king destroys all of the things that are wicked in his kingdom, boy, you look at the wickedness that was going on, you realize these people were wicked. This is a pagan society. Judah was absolutely... Listen, if you went to Judah and you were to look for a trace that they feared God and were concerned about holiness, there wasn't a trace. If you went to Judah and looked for the Word of God, you couldn't find it. It was lost. It was hidden. I mean, there was just no trace of godliness, and yet these people were God's people. And so God said, I'm going to judge them. Destroy them. And verse 19, it says, uh, Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and I shall be gathered into thy grave in peace, and then I shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Now stop there, and let's just make some final application tonight. <coughs> has anyone ever gotten away with anything? Ever? Never. I mean, honestly, no one's ever gotten away with anything. God knows everything, and He's a righteous judge. Sometimes people think, you know, well, God's not doing anything about this. And the reality of it is, is that God is. Sometimes God is dealing with sin in a very, very near sense right away. I've seen it. Uh, I think I, that I've recognized it many times where someone is living a certain way and then they get consequences for their sin and it's evident that it's because of their sin that they're having their consequences. Sometimes people go to their grave. Sometimes they go to the grave. Now it looks like they got away with it. You know where they go after the grave? If they don't know Jesus, they go to hell. And if, uh, but if they do know Jesus, my friend, they've lost a lot. Lost a whole lot. There's a lot to lose as a believer. You know, live for Jesus. And uh, on Judgment Day, when God is rewarding every person according to the works that He's done, whether they be good or evil, it'll be evident. It'll be evident. What do you suppose, by the way, this isn't a side, this isn't the message tonight, but what do you suppose will be the natural conclusion when somebody is in heaven and doesn't have any eternal reward. If God doesn't shame them, you know, have you ever, ever read the, the poems about every deed you've ever done written in a, in a note card and, you know, there's a library and just this clever story about how God remembers everything you've done. He brings it up and starts reading it. And then the end of it is that it's all under the blood, that sort of thing. Well, uh, it's, it makes a nice dramatic speech and so forth, and I, I'm sure there's some good things in it. But the reality of it is, is that God's not going to read out your sin in front of everybody in heaven. It's not going to be a readout time, but it'll be pretty evident that you were doing something when you should have been doing something else. 
right? <laughs> I mean, the, the reality is, if you don't have rewards in heaven, you're doing something else other than serving Jesus. And it does not take a brilliant individual to know that anything that's not serving the Lord Jesus is sin. Anything that's not for Christ is a waste of our lives. I mean, you think that somehow all oh, this person was really, really wicked, you know, or versus this person just played video games. It'll look the same. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> think about it. Just frittering away your life. Just wasting your life. Whatever the sin is. And Josiah is an individual that God said, you know something? This sin will be dealt with because I said so. I'm going to repent of what I've said I was going to do. I'm right to do this. My judgment is righteous. It's deserved. Josiah's never going to happen when you're around. Everything's going to be fine while you're here. And I don't know about you, but that is a big difference between that and Hezekiah, for instance. Now, Hezekiah was a good king, one of, listed as one of the good kings of Judah. But the difference between Josiah and Hezekiah, Hezekiah said, as long as, it doesn't, as long as evil doesn't happen in my lifetime, Josiah didn't want the evil to happen. Now look at what he does. Go to chapter 23 and we'll read through what Josiah did and we will see the conclusion. I want to remind us here that God is very merciful. God is very merciful. I mean, could you ask for more mercy than God has meted out here? Not in your life. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul. Wow! To perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. <laughs> what a leader. What a guy. See, when we see Josiah, when he is eight, he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. When he's 18, guess what he's doing? He's doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Now, I mean, it's a, big, it's a big step. He said, everybody get down here. I mean, he brought everybody. He brought all the people that belonged in the temple, the priests and the prophets and the scribes, and he brought all the people, small and great. If you're important, get here. If you're not important, get here. We're going to do something. And he stood by the wall of the temple, and he said, I'm going to keep the covenant. I'm going to keep the promise I made with God. And he made the people keep the, keep the covenant. And it's, it's incredible, actually, leadership. And I suppose on Father's Day, it, it helps for us to be reminded that you know a godly father will have a godly home. A godly man will have a godly home. Well, a godly man will have a godly home. He'll lead his home. He'll lead his wife. Uh, I have, on a few occasions, met ladies that didn't want godly leadership. But usually they were jaded about leadership because of ungodly leadership already. The truth of the matter is that almost every wife wants a husband who's a leader. I don't know that there are exceptions to that, really. Honestly, you know, you, there, there may be things that she says she wants, but what it really comes out to is that she wants him to be godly and she wants him to lead them to God. She doesn't want to have to lead in that way. And it's interesting that the king, it's amazing in Israel, you know, just, just these small comments like, this king did and everybody did wickedly. And this king did and everybody did right in the sight of the Lord. We ought to pray for we ought to pray for our leadership in our country because we're not a theocracy. This is not a nation uh, that's dedicated to the Lord, but we have, a, we have a history of people that love God in our nation. And our Constitution says we the people, we the people of the United States, we are the government. We answer to God whether our nation is godly or not. And we ought to stand up and say this is our decision. This is what we're going to be as a nation. And hold our leaders accountable to that. 
this is the only nation on earth, the only nation on earth that's a true republic, where literally we establish a government, we elect our leaders, and we are under their authority, and they are also under our authority as a nation. And so we're in a very unique circumstance as Americans. I'm not talking to the world tonight. I'm talking to the group here. We're all in the United States. And we're in a unique situation where we can literally stand and represent our country. I remember a couple years ago when it was Tony and Taj and Mrs. Price and myself and Joe Kaufman, right? We went up to the Kim Davis rally. And we wrote a sign that said, Florida stands with Kim Davis when she was arrested. We put, Florida stands with Kim Davis. Well, we're the only people I knew from Florida there. I said, well, we're representing Florida, and we stand for Kim Davis. And I put it on my truck on the way home. I put the sign, Florida stands with Kim Davis. And I represented the state of Florida for uh, standing, saying a woman doesn't have to marry homosexuals. And, uh, you know, you say, Pastor, well, you know what, there's probably a lot of people. Actually, I think probably probably if, if the will of the people were accurately represented, you know, the state of Florida voted not to have homosexual marriage. So I think I represented our state pretty well. But I did. I went and represented us. Taj did, and Tony did, and Mrs. Price, and, and Joe Kaufman. And we said, hey, this is what Florida believes. Why do we let wicked people represent us? Why do we let the wicked people tell our leaders what we want and demand concessions from them? And it's incredible here, actually, Josiah's example. He said to the people, he said, we're going to be a godly nation. And they said, okay. And you know something? They all benefited by Josiah not being judged in his lifetime, didn't they? That's, I'm going to do this to Judah, but they all benefited by having a godly king. And you know something, my friend? God's merciful. And if you'll be godly, people will benefit by your godliness as well. Stand for right. Push people to do right. That's what Josiah did. What an admirable man he was. What wonderful character he had. He followed after mercy. Let's look at, at verse 16. Well, let's, 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 let's read toward verse 16. In verse 5... Well, let's start where he destroys Baal. Verse 4, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for who? For Baal, Baal, and for the grove and for the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields. They had Baal worshiping vessels in the temple where God was supposed to be. And they put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places where do, where do kings get to ordain priests? Is that how it works? I don't think so. In the high places in the cities of Judah and the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron, and burned it at the brook Kidron, and stamped it small to powder, and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. And he broke down the houses of the Sodomites, that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the groves. Uh, in verse 10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Uh, go down to verse 13, the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded. What? Yeah, they were still there from Solomon. The king of Israel built it for Ashtaroth and the abomination of the Zidonians. And verse 14, he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. And now verse 15 and 16 will take us just pretty much as most of the way we're going to go this evening. More of the altar that was at Bethel, Bethel and the high places which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made. Both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it to small powder, stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And then, as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers which were there in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. And he said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is a sepulcher of the man of God which came from Judah, and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. You remember this? The young prophet, 
supposed to go and proclaim the things in the lying prophet and so forth. And uh, it, in verse 18, Josiah said, and he said, let him alone, let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone, that the bones of the prophet, with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. Now, what we see here is that Josiah cleaned house. He didn't just say we're going to serve God. He got everything out that was keeping them from serving God. And my friend, if God is good enough to be merciful to you and say, you know, you deserve judgment. It's written. You know what the Bible says. You deserve it. And the judgment will be me to doubt. But if God's good enough to be merciful to you, you better go get the garbage out. Read it. Josiah didn't play the game of saying, well, you know, there's some historical significance in these things that were built by Solomon. Do you suppose that Solomon built some pretty magnificent altars to these, to Ashtaroth and uh, and to the the abomination of the Zidonians for, for Chemosh? Do you think maybe that's what Solomon built? It lasted that long. Do you think there might have been some architectural uh, benefit by those things? Well, no, not benefit. Do you think there might have been some beauty in them and just something like, you know, that, that the people are proud of? Well, sure. Yes. You know what you know what Josiah did? He knocked that stuff down. He took it down. Because it represented well, because it was wicked, because it, it was idolatrous. And it didn't preserve anything. You know, a lot of times believers, you keep garbage. You have bad relationships, you won't throw your old love letters away. You won't delete somebody's phone number. Mm. Uh, you won't stop talking to somebody that's from the past. You won't quit. You just, well, you know, I mean, you know, I just, you know, it's not, I'm not, there's not, I'm not going to do anything. You just, you know, won't have that. Uh, you won't throw away things that are bad memories or just get things out of your life. You just hold on to them. Right. Stuff in your homes that doesn't belong there. And maybe right now you're not looking at it or seeing it. Why don't you throw it away? Why don't you get rid of it? You burn the garbage, burn the trash. Break it up, smash it. And when you do, it'll be a lot easier to not go back to it. Don't have it anymore. Go burn some bridges. You know, cross over and burn it. And that's what Josiah did. He said, I'm going to commit us. We're committed to serving God. I'm not just going to promise God so that I can be preserved. I'm not just trying to survive. I, I want to please God. And he cleaned the house, cleaned the country up. And uh, I closed my Bible, but God's conclusion is... Uh, let me see if I can find it again. I don't know if I can find Second Kings now. It's gone. Okay. Uh, God's conclusion in uh, verse... 26, uh, or I'm sorry, verse 25, like him, unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. He started off, I want to serve God, and the Bible says he didn't turn right or left. And he was. There was no king before him like that. You say, not David? No. Not Solomon? No. Not, you can list any king and there was no king that was like Josiah. And the Bible says, he kept all the law of Moses. Notwithstanding, verse 26, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with, or had provoked him with all. And of course, you can read the rest according to this in Chronicles. What a testimony of a man. What a testimony of God's mercy. So let's take three things, shall we? First of all, we have a man who had the testimony that when he was a youth, that he decided he was going to serve God. Isn't it great that an eight-year-old can say, I'm going to serve God? A lot of times, bless their heart. You know, it, you know maybe they will. Boy, you know, an eight-year-old can say, I'm going to serve God and do it. Josiah didn't have any great examples. He was the leader. An eight-year-old led. When he was 18, he was a full-blown leader. I mean, he, he said, we're all serving God. And then he started to just tear things up. <coughs> he tore down anything that kept him from serving God. And it kept back the hand of judgment for his lifetime. You know, it's about all somebody can do. 
learned some years ago, I'm not trying to leave an eternal legacy. I'm trying to earn eternal rewards. I would love to know that Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church will live long after I'm gone. I think it'd be cool if this church didn't even remember where it got started, but that it just kept serving God. That just people, just for years, if the Lord tarries however long, that this church please God until He comes. You know, the truth of the matter is, is, is that I'm not so naive as to think that that's a high likelihood. I have too many times seen churches that God was blessing, God was mightily using, and I've watched the people that generation pass off the scene, and I've watched the churches just be a different church afterward, not daily change. And you know something that used to really bother me? I used to try to figure out how I could keep our church from going bad when I'm not around. And you know what I realized? I don't need to. God has a remnant in every generation. He has truth in every generation. He'll raise them up. And uh, you know what? Maybe this one will last longer than, than uh, some. Or maybe it won't last long at all. But it'd be okay with me if it makes it till I die. Because I won't answer to God for it after that. That's how Josiah lived. I think it's a great example. Josiah didn't say, well, if it's not going to leave me a lasting legacy, then you can just forget about it anyway. Might as well just go ahead and let everybody worship Baal and Ashtaroth and Chemosh and all these guys. No, Josiah said this is wicked, and God's been merciful in our lifetime. We're going to be righteous. And we deserve judgment, but if God's going to be merciful to us, thank God for His mercy, and He responded to it. And then we saw that He responded by being merciful Himself. If you notice, the the I, I read the Scripture, but I didn't, I didn't comment on it. The prophet whose bones are resting there, who had, who had prophesied against that altar that Josiah would do what he did to it, he said, leave him alone. He didn't do anything. He's not part of this. And Josiah demonstrated the same mercy that he received. So he's just a great example in so many ways. And I hope that you'll think on that this week. Don't be so upset and, and concerned that the world's being wicked. You just represent God. You represent God. You're a father. Well, other people may not, but our house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And uh, represent your community. <clears throat> it's always bothered me. The percentages in Wilton Manors and now coming to be Oakland Park. It's always bothered me that in Wilton Manor, 17% of the population are perverts. And 100% of leadership are perverts. It's not right, is it? Our Supreme Court bothers me. A nation which has more evangelical Christians than any other, quote, religious group, has not a single evangelical Christian represented on the Supreme Court in our nation. Nine Supreme Court justices. What, something like six Catholics and three Jewish people? No Christians. Catholics aren't Christians, in case you're wondering. Uh, our, our nation was very clear about that when we fled them in Europe. And so, uh, we as Christians, I'm not, I'm not preaching, you know, well, I, I am a little bit, but I'm not preaching it. You know, we need to go off into judicial activism. I, I don't think that that, I think that preaching the gospel is our thing. What I'm saying is Christians, stand up. You see that rainbow flag flying with our, with our nation's stars and stripes on it? Listen, fly the Christian flag. Make one. Put a Bible out there. You know, put scriptures in your front yard. I'm serious. Put, put scriptures out there. And put, you know, God bless America and God please uh, protect Oakland Park. May our city be blessed by God. And may we be, may you be merciful to us for our wicked. May you be merciful to our wicked. And just be blatant and open, generous, kind, and uh, active as a believer. Don't be afraid to stand for right righteousness. And I appreciate that about Josiah. I understand the difference between a theocracy and a, and a republic. But a republic is better than 
than uh, um, a uh, monarchy. And that's what Israel has become. A republic has a better shot at being represented by Christians than a monarchy does. Monarchy, one person makes all the decisions. A republic, the people make the decisions. And so, take heart. God's merciful. And if you'll respond to His mercy, He'll be merciful to you. And that's all you could ask for, and you can be merciful to others. Father, thank You for these lessons that we take from the great example of a godly king who didn't turn to his right or to his left, but he set out to serve God and did it. Help us, help us, God, to follow these examples and to know you as Josiah did. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.